the core principle is make the most of the times we're in. However you want to say that, make the most of where you are right this minute. So there are massive things that you might want to change on the planet. Maybe you want to topple a politician or you want to change the way an industry works or something like that. However, in most cases, that's outside of your abilities, right? So you have to be able to make the most of where you are. So what change could you do in your local community? What industry could you change or what local business could you change the way they do things? Let's say you're fascinated with the idea of reducing plastic. How could you reduce your own plastic? And for me, the way I say that is make the most of the times we're in, which is I think we live in extraordinary times and I want to make the most of the times that I've been born into. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dichotomy Podcast. This is a show dedicated to exploring the dichotomies we experience in business and in life. My name's Mike Reed, and I'm a guy who's incredibly fascinated by understanding why we make the decisions we do in life, and ultimately, how do we lead a good life? As a business owner, I get the pressures of managing business, family, money, health can create great inner conflicts around what we actually want out of our business and our lives. This podcast is dedicated to exploring just that. I hope you enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Dichotomy Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Today's episode is with a gentleman by the name of Daniel Priestley. And this is a special episode because Dan is my business partner at Dent, uh, alongside my other business partner, Glenn Carlson. If you don't know much about Dent, shame on you. Dent is a multi-award winning global business accelerator, which Daniel, my business partner, Glenn Carlson in Sydney and myself co-founded. And since 2010, we've been working with over 3,000 entrepreneurs around the world to help them stand out, scale up and make a real impact in their industry. It all began with a little old book that Daniel wrote called Become a Key Person of Influence. That book went on to become bestseller. More than 100,000 entrepreneurs around the world have or got a copy of the Key Person of Influence book. And since then, Dan's written a number of bestselling books from titles like Entrepreneur Revolution, Oversubscribed, 24 Assets, and he is regularly invited around the world as a keynote speaker to uh, share his insights on business and entrepreneurship. I got together with Dan when I was in London, one of my stops on my sabbatical. And we get together and we get to talk about a lot of really cool things around business, around life, around family. And for me, this was a really wonderful episode to record because Dan's a guy I've always looked up to and admired ever since we met eight years ago when my other business partner, Glenn, and he were launching Dent in Australia. He's a guy who has always had a certain aura about him. don't know how to put it in any other way. But he is a incredibly visionary, smart, intelligent human being who sees the world a little bit differently with a pretty incredible imagination and an ability to be able to connect dots and connect ideas in ways that I think most people really can't. And it's certainly one of Dan's superpowers as a entrepreneur. So in today's episode, we get into some really fascinating dichotomies that certainly I've faced, that he's faced, and that I think many people listening will have experienced or could resonate with themselves. We talk about the challenges of being building a performance business versus maintaining a family life and how you surrender to the simplicity of family while also building a performance-based business. We talk about reconciling being a lifestyle entrepreneur with a performance entrepreneur, is that possible? And and what do both of those things mean? And we also talk about the dichotomy of becoming famous for what you do versus being behind the scenes and how to manage both of those kind of competing desires that certainly he, I, and I think many people listening who may be running a business would experience as well. So, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. It was an honor and a privilege to sit down with my main man, Dan, and uh, please enjoy the show. Are you enjoying this show? Do you think this is something more entrepreneurs should be tuning into? I hope so. 
that's the reason I created it. You know, for me, I felt like what was really lacking in the entrepreneur space was not just guidance on the tactics for growing a business, but on how to navigate the emotions of running a business too, and ultimately living both a balanced and extraordinary life as an entrepreneur. So if you're digging what I'm putting down, please head to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this podcast and give it a review. Reviews help a ton. They help the show get found on iTunes and elsewhere. They help say to people, this is worth listening to, and they make me smile. So I'd be super grateful for your honest feedback and review love. Thanks so much. Daniel Priestley, the man, the myth, the legend. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on the show. Mate, um, good to be here, catching up in London. Sunny London, middle of winter. It's the middle of winter. We had a sunny day the other day. We did. But, um, mate, I thought it might be good to, at the start of 2019, to uh, reflect on 2018. And uh, I saw a Facebook post the other day that you shared, which shared a few highlights from 2018. Can you just share with us what were some of the most meaningful things that happened for you last year? Yeah, well, in that post, I basically said that um, all my plans and goals and schemes kind of went out the window a little bit. My birthday's in January and I was out to lunch with my wife and we were talking about how wonderful it is. We've got our two little boys and our family's complete and now we can start planning holidays and doing all that sort of stuff now that we're out of the baby phase. And uh, 12 hours later, we discovered we were pregnant again um, with baby number three. So we were back into getting ready for baby, moving house, um, basically planning for something we hadn't planned. Um, a, a wonderful surprise, right? Um, if my daughter's ever listening to this, <laughs> the most wonderful <laughs> surprise. Uh, yeah, so 2018, I just basically had to put everything on on hold and, and what I thought I would do and, um, and just change. And it was actually a wonderful year. Business performed phenomenally well. I got all sorts of things done. My book ended up in top of the charts. I won some really prestigious awards and judged some great awards. Uh, we had some new records with you know, our client acquisition and the results that we were getting with clients. And actually, it was really quite nice. Because I wasn't planning everything, I was actually just a lot more responsive mm -hmm. um, to what was going on. And it was a lovely, yeah, powerful year. A lot, a lot actually happened given that all plans were out the window. Mm. Do you feel you thrive more in uncertainty or certainty? Oh, definitely uncertainty. I, I, well, actually, I, emotion, I emotionally like uncertainty. But with that said, in Dent, we have people whose whole job in the business is create a lot of certainty. And um, so Donna, for example, you know, creates an enormous amount of certainty um, around me. She works with my PA, Susie, and she's the general manager. So between the two of them, they create an enormous amount of certainty around me and handle all the details and scheduling and all that sort of stuff. And actually, because of all that certainty, it allows me to be a bit crazy and do what I want and come up with all sorts of ideas. What was the craziest idea in 2019? <laughs> Having baby number three. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that was a uh, if that was the intentional, intentional idea or a uh, spontaneous idea. She just decided that um, it was her time to come to planet Earth, and she did so in such style. Um, we decided to get a bigger house, and we got basically what we could only describe as our dream home. Mm -hmm. And we moved into the dream home, and we yeah, and and all sorts of wonderful things actually fell into place as a result of her showing up. Sitting in the dream home, I can attest to the fact that it is the dream home. It's and, pretty good. Huh? Uh, we're on the third level looking out over London and it's, uh, it's a beautiful spot. And on that question of certainty and uncertainty, right? Because I, I feel like for a lot of entrepreneurs, they probably don't appreciate the degree of uncertainty they've got to face in, in building a business. What do you think is the, the harshest truth that most entrepreneurs are struggle to accept or aren't willing to accept? Great question. There's a lot of harsh truths with entrepreneurship that aren't immediately evident when you get in, unless you've spent time around really successful entrepreneurs before up close, but behind the curtain. So the first harsh truth that I always highlight is that it's hard and it gets harder. So your job is to solve problems that people can't or don't want to solve for themselves. So by its very nature, entrepreneurship at its very core is incredibly hard, just simply because if the problem that you're solving in the world were easy to solve or desirable to solve, people would already be doing it and they wouldn't need you. So you're dealing with something that other people find complex and challenging um, or undesirable, and you're 
you're going to dedicate yourself to solving that particular problem for others. So it's hard and it gets harder because you start on day one purely able to focus. On day one of starting a business, you're just able to focus on the customer's needs. Um, and then very rapidly, you need to think about how do I build a team? So now you've got the customer's needs and the team's needs. Maybe you want to raise some investment. So now you're managing the expectations of an investor. So piece by piece, you add layers of complexity. You think, gee, I'm doing well in this city. Maybe I should open in four more cities. So now you add the complexity of geography. You build your team up to 40 to 50 people. When you have 50 employees, um, on a team, you have 1,225 lines of communication of potential people who could be talking to each other. Um, so all sorts of complexity. It's hard and it gets harder. In the same way as boxing, success in boxing in the early stages, you meet and beat someone who's not terribly good like you. And then the more successful you become, the more you face bigger opponents um, who are better. And you've got even more chance of being punched in the face really hard. So businesses and entrepreneurship's a bit like that. I often meet entrepreneurs and they say, oh, you know, I'm facing all these challenges. I'm facing all these problems and it's difficult. And I go, yeah, you're an entrepreneur. That's the point. It's almost like meeting a football player who says, oh, you know, there's all these people whose job is to try and stop me scoring a goal. I can't believe it. You know, I thought football would just be so much fun, but these people, they're trying to stop me. Yes, that is football. If there weren't people trying to stop you from scoring a goal, you would actually not be playing football. You'd just be doing football drills. So entrepreneurship by its very nature is hard and gets harder. Would you say, having met thousands of entrepreneurs all over the world, do you think most entrepreneurs should be entrepreneurs? I think that there's not one type of entrepreneur. Oprah Winfrey would have been a terrible hedge fund manager, um, Warren Buffett would have been a terrible talk show host. Bill Gates would not have been great at leading a music revolution and being a music publisher. And Richard Branson would not have been great at being a software engineer uh, developer. So we have to find our thing. We have to, as entrepreneurs, we're, there's not a single breed of um, entrepreneur. They're, they're very vastly different entrepreneurs. So it's important to find your thing. And then also, I don't really believe in entrepreneurs. I believe in entrepreneurial teams. So I don't know anyone who's successful who's done it on their own, genuinely done it on their own. There are people who look like they've done it on their own, but not when you get behind the scenes. So if you go and talk to someone like, if you go and see someone like a Tim Ferriss, a lot of people think Tim Ferriss is by himself, but there's about 12 core people on the team who make Tim Ferriss look like a solo agent. If you go and talk to Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary looks like a big standout character, and yet you know, Gary has a team of 600 people. Um, there's a dedicated team whose whose sole client is Gary. Mm. Um, you know, their job is to make Gary look larger than life. So entrepreneurship is a team sport. Even, you know, sports like tennis. A Roger Federer has a core team of probably a dozen people making Roger Federer function. And, and entrepreneurship is the same. So with that said, I don't think everyone is necessarily a founder. Like start with a blank piece of paper and vision up something i think there's a lot of people who's were much better suited as implementation mm. and execution the real value that gets created in an enterprise is when it scales there's the first 10 people the ragtag dirty dozen who come together to kick off a business and you know not a lot of value actually gets created in that phase you get a proof of concept you get a product you get a basic product you get some case studies some testimonials you get a lot of what doesn't work and that's the first 10 people. And then the business doesn't really have valuation. Like if we're purely talking about economic value and talking about value of the shares, the value of the shares kind of kicks in at for real when there's about 50 people on the team. So realistically, the types of people who grow it from 10 to 50 people are actually the ones who create the economic value. And yet all the glory goes to the person who started with a blank sheet of paper and came up with some sort of an idea. Mm. It's interesting you say that, you know, it's like, I think it's the reason why we work so well together is because, you know, you are this incredible visionary personality who's cooking up ideas all the time. You, you, the way you look at the world is really fascinating. And, you know, it's, whenever we get together and we chat and you sort of talk me through these different concepts and models you've cooked up and there's always a new one every time and it's sort of stuff which I go, Jesus, that's so simple. And yet I'd never thought of it that way or no one else had really thought of it that way. And you're able to really bring the complex down to the simple. And so maybe if I ask you, right? And yet I'm not very good 
at the week to week. So I can't honestly, I can't function without people like yourself and Donna and Glenn and like all the people who who make up the team at Dent. Like if you strip it away to, if you said Dan, you personally have to build the biggest possible company that's just you, right? I mean, there's not a lot that I can actually do, and I don't know how long it would last. What would you say your superpower is? I certainly have a superpower around communicating the vision. So, you know, a big part of what I do is, you know, sort of getting up on stage and talking about the entrepreneur revolution, the entrepreneur journey, the entrepreneur mindset. Um, So that's that kind of like sharing a vision, sharing an idea and sort of refining and coming up with that uh, would be a part of what I do. I seem to have a talent for getting that into print. So, you know, the four books, I never set out to be an author um, and my English teacher would be utterly shocked <laughs> if if she discovered that I had four best-selling books. But sort of getting the vision into print, getting it on stage um, would be something. Um, and then if I really tune into what has been probably my best superpower, I'd call it recruitment, enrolling others. So getting really interesting, cool, talented people to come and join the team and to become clients. So... I guess my superpower is enrolling people in something. Hmm. How did you discover that? Well, I started in, at age 19, I started in a sales role and I was pretty, pretty good at that, provided I believe in the product and provided I wholeheartedly believe in what I'm talking about. So there came a point where I, I didn't believe so much in what I was selling and went off and started my own company with something that I could believe in. And then I did really well in that. So I used tools like marketing and advertising to enroll people in what we we're talking about and and then i had some powerful conversations to enroll people onto the team and put together a team of four or five people and to get really high caliber speakers to come and speak at our events um required a bit of you know enrolling them mm. in what we're doing so yeah i think you know the clarity i have around that just having this conversation is probably that core skill that i think i might be good at is enrolling people in an idea for someone who's listening, is there are there any things that you would recommend, whether it be personality profiles or those kind of tools, to help better identify what is that, you know, secret weapon they can personally bring to the world? Finding the thing, yeah. So Roger Hamilton's Wealth Dynamics is a tool that kind of helped me tune in. He talks about eight entrepreneur profiles. For about a year and a half, I actually traveled around the world speaking on that topic um, with Roger. So, you know, I kind of got a deeper understanding of it. The other one is just looking at your the people that you naturally respect and admire and who you feel like you're a bit like. So I feel like I'm a little bit like a Richard Branson or a Steve Jobs, you know, which is a particular type of entrepreneur. And I don't necessarily feel like, like a Warren Buffett, a trader, like someone who's trading the stock. I've got a client... Um, Jason, who's a really, really good stock market trader, and I like him, and he's cool, and he likes me, and I'm cool to mm. him, but we're different. You know, he's really perceptive and he's studying the markets and piecing it all together, whereas I'm flying at a high altitude. Do you have you ever experienced, call it ego or whatever else, sabotage, you know, what your superpower is in the pursuit of what you think, you know, you might want to be good at instead? Yeah, I think that's certainly probably happened. And here's the really fortunate thing for me. All through my early 20s, I worked with big egos, really big egos, um, people who were very famous, getting paid ten to $20,000 to give a keynote speech, all of that sort of stuff. So I was around these big egos. And I could see up close how they constantly sabotaged, um, how the ego got in the way and how they would make things about them and hijack a conversation or they would, without knowing, get people to agree, get their teams to agree to things. They didn't really agree. They would just pretend to agree. And I watched this kind of behavior over and over and over again, and I saw the downside of that behavior. So probably a hundred times I swore to myself, if ever I get even the slightest bit of attention or fame or you know, success, these are the traps. These are the things to not, these are the things to stay in the way. So I'm hopefully I'm carrying some of those experiences with me and not allowing ego to get in the way. However, one of the other things that probably, here's probably how my ego does get in the way. I like to be liked. And sometimes when there's a difficult conversation with someone, 
my strategy is to just let them do their thing, even though I can tell it's probably not going to work. I stand back, don't say much until such time as they run headfirst into a brick wall. And then I explain why they ran into brick wall when I probably should have a more difficult conversation and be disliked for that and sort of share some of that experience. So probably my, my ego is working in the other way as opposed to trying to push in and speak up. I'll just, out of a desire to be liked, hold back and just let people run their course. Mm. For you, what's the payoff of being liked? Just that, you know, the warm, fuzzy feeling, the books that sell, the events that fill up. I like to be liked. So, which is natural, right? We all do. The likes. If that's you, I reckon I'm 10x you, right? Because I'm a very diplomatic, agreeable kind of guy. I like to keep the peace. I disarm. So, yeah, I can really relate to that. And so, given that you're aware of that, like, kind of self-sabotaging that's going on, I suppose, or there's a sabotage happening, why have you not done anything about it till now? It's not that I've not done anything about it when I become aware of it. Because the beautiful thing about the ego is it's really good at hiding out. The ego knows you really well. It is you. So, the ego relabels everything as I'm being supportive, you know, being respectful, or I'm not being, I'm not being an ego. The best thing the ego can possibly do is to say, this is me not being my ego. This is me being, you know, super zen which is like the ultimate ninja move of the ego so it's it's like the ability to catch yourself saying actually what's really going on here is i'm avoiding a difficult conversation out of a desire to just be liked and diplomatic and what i need to do have a perhaps a difficult conversation lock horns a little bit and thrash it out and see if we can get to a better place how do you normally approach having difficult conversations my main strategy is to flag it up so I've got some awareness, some views or some ideas or views that are coming up for me are counter to what the strategy is that we're running. I need to have a bit of a difficult conversation with you in order to thrash something out, lock horns and get to a better place. Is it okay if we have a conversation that might be a little confrontational? Mm, interesting. I was chatting to a girlfriend the other day and she was telling me about a friend of hers that uses a framework particular people in his life and he kind of calls it level 10 feedback and it's the idea that he comes to an agreement with someone a close friend or colleague or business partner or whatever it is and and they agree to scale the feedback they give one another and so you know a level eight and above feedback is some pretty hard-hitting feedback and so before he goes and has a conversation with someone to deliver that feedback, he says to them, hey, look, I've got an awareness. I've got something to, to share with you. It's level nine feedback around X, Y, Z. Am I able to share it with you? Do I have permission? And that person can either give the permission to say, I'm in the space to receive that or, you know, now's not the time for me to receive that. And uh, I found that just such a good, useful... Yeah, it's an it's agreement. ...little agreement to have with someone to to be really honest and, and raw. And also if it's said from a genuine space, there are some times where people are not in the right space to get level 10 feedback or whatever, mm. um, or level eight. You know, if you're just about to go give a talk or um, if you've just had a difficult conversation already today, it's like, actually, can we have that tomorrow? I'm, I'm battered, I'm bruised. All right. Mate, shifting gears a little bit. The other night we spent a bit of time talking about principles and... I'm curious to ask you, what are the principles that guide you most in life? And then what are the work principles that most guide you as well? Okay, so this is from the book Principles by Ray Dalio. And, you know, his whole thing is about meaningful work, meaningful relationships. So I guess one of my principles is the core principle is make the most of the times we're in. However you want to say that, make the most of where you are right this minute. So there are massive things that you might want to change on the planet. Maybe you want to topple a politician or you want to change the way a, an industry works or something like that. However, in most cases, that's outside of your abilities, right? So you have to be able to make the most of where you are. So what change could you do in your local community? What industry could you change or what local business could you change the way they do things? Let's say you're fascinated with the idea of reducing plastic. How could you reduce your own plastic? And for me, the way I say that is make the most of the times we're in, mm. which is I think we live in extraordinary times and I want to make the most of the times that I've been born into. So that's the core principle. And then that spins off two elements, which is self and others. 
So how do I make the most of the times we're in for myself and my own enjoyment, the fun and the rewards that would be selfish? And also, how do I make the most of the times that we're in for others to um, maximize joy and reduce suffering for other people and other animals and the environment? So for me, it's about striking the balance between self and others. If I do things that are too self-centered, initially that brings an initial rush of enjoyment satisfaction but very quickly that turns into an emptiness of that's not actually what i'm here to do and also if i do too much for others and don't reward myself that turns into feelings of regret or not regret but altruism and i'm not being you know it's one-sided and i'm give 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 but not getting anything out of this myself so it's about finding this really healthy balance about make the most of the times we're in with what I can do for self and others. Mm. And for me, the idea of balance, that kind of middle path is very much the, the quest that I suppose I'm on with this podcast is, you know, exploring the dichotomies we face in life where we felt torn, pulled and in opposing directions. It's, you know, how do you blend, how do you blend those two kind of polarities to, to find, you know, a happy balance and, you know, I've said this before on the show that, you know, one of my big dichotomies is feeling like the life of building an empire in the form of a business and leading that kind of high performance, high octane life doesn't marry together with leading the simpler life, family life, mm-hmm. you know, slowing down, smelling the roses, all that kind of stuff. Now, as I've progressed on my own life journey, I've, you know, I've spent time with people like you who living in this world right as of today you've kind of got the family life mm-hmm. you've got the empire how well do you feel you can blend those two and is it possible to you know build a high performance business and lead a really simple enjoyable you know family life at home as well yeah i think it is possible i think all of the extremes there are unhealthy elements to that and it's about finding the balance and the interesting thing too is at the extremes you also find automatic triggers that bring you back to balance. So for example, being incredibly present and still and aware of the moment actually frees up resources to get creative and to get inspired and to develop something that could scale. (laughs) And it's very hard to create something that will scale out of a desire to scale. It's very easy to create something that will scale out of a awareness or a presence with a problem. So being present is actually one of the key ingredients for building something that would scale. And then by scaling something, by making something really big, you actually find yourself having some incredible moments, phenomenal things happen that make you feel present. So I think it's about not powering through those moments. So when you're having a moment of stillness and enjoying that moment of stillness and having a moment of creativity, it's not trying to reset into how does this scale? And when you're scaling something and growing something and developing something and a moment comes along that uh, that's magical, it's like, well, oh, okay, how, how do I enjoy this moment? It's recognizing that, that we, we bounce um, and that one is an ingredient for the other. So they actually provide a nice dance um, together. And, you know, the other one is like having a family is incredibly distracting and limits your choices and limits your abilities and limits your ability to jump on a plane and limits your ability to do a late night or to do an early morning or to just disappear for two weeks or to pursue some random passion that you don't know where it leads. So on the flip, on one side, having a family is incredibly damaging to high performance. On the other side, it's incredibly focusing. So it focuses you on what works. It focuses you on execution. It focuses you on doing things that matter. It gives you a huge purpose or a huge why by default. It gets you in over your head on commitments bachelors just wouldn't naturally gravitate towards. So, you know, and then you end up doing things really well because you're committed to doing them. You know, I think guys especially rise to the occasion when we're in hot water as opposed to, you know, left to our own devices, we tend to like to just roam the earth, you know, having the next adventure. One has the ingredient for the other. So fascinating. One of those things that you, before you embark on, let's say, a journey of, you know, starting a family, 
I think the default assumption, as you say, it's to think that it's going to hinder you achieving more in business, I'd say. And uh, it's so counterintuitive, yet I feel so right that actually that's the very thing that allows you to rise up to a whole new level. The statistics on this are clear as well. So the most highly paid CEOs have large families. It's actually all things being equal, person who has a family and kids actually tends to have a higher income and a bigger business. And the reason for that is because you have to. So you figure it out. You know, the truth is that if I didn't have kids and if I didn't have family, I would probably live an incredibly minimalist existence. One of my happiest times was a six to nine month period where I lived out of two suitcases and just bounced around the world. And it was just hotels, suitcases. I had two pairs of jeans and a couple of white shirts and a couple of blazers. And like that was life. And I was incredibly happy. And realistically, in order to live that way really, really well, I needed about 80,000 pounds, $100,000 type thing myself and a business that picked up the travel expenses. And basically that was pretty much bliss. You know, it wasn't terribly difficult. So left to my own devices, I'd probably accidentally just do that. So you're a big believer in the idea the the commitment and the problem precedes the solution. Yeah, 100%. I can't sp- I'm reluctant to get into gender type things, but the masculine energy tends to rise to the problem. You know, the feminine energy tends to produce and grow regardless. And the masculine, like if you look at the lion, the lion just sits around lazy as shit, waiting for a pack of hyenas to rock up. But when a pack of hyenas do rock up, if you look at the lionesses, they're constantly hunting, constantly producing, constantly providing by default. And the male lion who's about 40, 50% bigger than a female, sits in the sun and does nothing all day and just lazy. And the only thing he gets up for is to breed or if a threat comes along. And if a threat comes along, springs to action and seriously takes care of it. So a female lioness has a hard time with one or two hyenas. A male lion will then just go and plow through a dozen of them and finish them off won't do that unless they arrive. And I've found the masculine trait, the male energy, when there's a reason to get the hell into gear, you get into gear. Whereas more feminine entrepreneurs are more consistent. They just get things done week to week, day to day. More masculine entrepreneurs rise to competition, mm. rise to challenge. Mm. And if you don't have big challenge or competition, just a commitment, you know, providing for a family is a challenge. So it kind of right levels you up. Mm. It's interesting, right? And you're and you're right. You know, the masculine, and feminine, obviously being gender neutral, is uh, yeah, we we all exhibit masculine an and feminine in, exactly. in different uh, settings. And um, it's an interesting concept to think about. You know, perhaps the very thing that you know some entrepreneurs may need to be able to rise to the occasion is cultivating more masculine energy within themselves mm-hmm. that will you know allow them to to do that. I don't know how much and uh, vice versa. Yeah, they might need more feminine. Yeah, might need to might need to get off the merry-go-round of drama or solving big problems and just get into week to week. Mm. What do you feel in the kind of your, your life journey and business journey to date, what are the areas of life where you felt most torn or afflicted? Or what are the, the points in time where you've had a the really... Dichotomies. The a dichotomy. The tea versus coffee. That you've... Uh, White wine or red wine. The big questions of life. <laughs> um, so obviously the family versus the global wanderer, you know, is the huge dichotomy. Footloose, fancy free bachelor versus the responsible provider of, you know, for the family. The lifestyle business or the performance business, you know, do I want to just have a fun, small, flexible business or do I want global domination? Tell us more about that. And the, the third one I was going to mention is famous or behind the scenes. I'd love to dig into each of those. Each of those. So obviously we've talked a little bit about family, family and business. Tell us more about lifestyle performance. Explain what do you mean by that and then, you know, which have you chosen? So after seeing thousands of entrepreneurs, there are two very distinct, very clear entrepreneurs who present themselves over and over and over again. The lifestyle entrepreneur and the performance entrepreneur. So the lifestyle entrepreneur is typically gravitating towards fun and freedom and flexibility and income, a performing P&L. They tend to, at their extreme, they think that having a lifestyle would be operating by themselves and actually just purely being a one-person solopreneur. 
the evidence and the statistics behind that don't line up. People who operate by themselves don't earn a lot of money, don't take off, don't get traction. There are exceptions to the rule, but the vast majority statistically, so for example, I think it's something like 79% of businesses in the UK don't employ anyone. And that 79% of all businesses do 7 or 8% of the revenue in the economy. Like the GDP of the UK is less than 10% is made up by 75% of all the businesses in the economy. And that's because small one-person businesses don't make a lot of money. Entrepreneurship's a team sport. So the, the true lifestyle business that does work really well is a team of three to 12 people. Very much, if you want a really great lifestyle business, it's centered around a key person of influence, someone who's comfortable playing the role of evangelizing a vision or evangelizing a business or a product, who gets out there and becomes known, liked, and trusted in the industry. They rise to the top 5% of their industry and they take a small team with them. And everyone does better. So because they're speaking on stage, they generate so much opportunity. The salesperson earns more money. The technical delivery people earn more money. Everyone's doing better. But the lifestyle element of that tops out at about 8 to 12 people because it becomes too complex to manage the team. It's a self-organizing team. Between 3 and 8 people, it's definitely a self-organizing team. And some teams can cope right up to about 12. So that's the lifestyle business. The performance business kind of starts at around 40 to 50 people. It's optimized valuation. So whereas the lifestyle business is always about the P&L, um, how much income are we making, the performance business is about the asset. We don't care really. Like, for example, you'll see Facebook generate users before they generate income, and they don't care about that because they want the asset. They want the data. They want the user base. Um, and then they monetize a P&L. So they're very uh, – performance entrepreneurs are very balance sheet focused, and lifestyle entrepreneurs are very – p l focused. So all about a mix of assets. It's all about building a culture as an asset, building a system as an asset, building products as assets, raising funding to acquire more assets, doing acquisitions, acquiring talent and retaining talent. It's all the language of assets, acquisition, acquiring talent, right? And the p l entrepreneur is the language of, of p l hustle, performance, sales, leads, appointments, presentations, sales, conversions. It's all that P&L language. So the performance entrepreneur is obviously building a big global business and sacrificing the short term for the long term, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and the lifestyle entrepreneur is just having a lot more fun and flexibility. Interestingly, the military has got different formalized team structures. So you have a two-person scout team who are out scouting an opportunity. That's the smallest team or a two-person sniper team. The smallest team is two. Then you have a four-person fire team who are engaged in some sort of a immediate urgent. So a four-person team might be, if there's some sort of a unexpected event in the military, they fall off into, they break into four-person fire teams and they operate as four-person units very briefly. And then the normal team size is eight. It's called a section. And then there's no team size up until a platoon, which is starts at about 40 people. So there's nothing, there is actually nothing between 8 and 40 people. And if you talk to anyone in the military, what's the best place to be in the military? Who has the most fun? A section commander. So a section commander has a team of 8, including themselves, um, and they're having a great old time. Fun, freedom, flexibility, hanging out. They've got all the benefits of being in the military without the harsh responsibilities and the more difficult roles are when you go beyond section commander and they joke inside the military and say just don't take the promotion like just stay section commander that's the funnest part that's where the juice is worth the most squeeze platoon commander you're responsible for 40 people this is where you're dealing with all sorts of dramas and it's the same as entrepreneurship the eight person section commander is having the most fun and the 40 person platoon commander is dealing with a bit more bit more drama. And so for you, which of the two have yeah. you chosen and, and, and what's the, uh, you know, how have you faced a kind of a bit of a dichotomy in, in which one's the right one for you? Well, the single me, the bachelor me, chose performance and was just totally happy living on planes. And, you know, when I was a bachelor, I was a gold frequent flyer on two airlines. I bounced between Australia, Singapore, USA, you know, UK. And I thought that was actually a great way to live. And my working hours were really simple from when I opened my eyes to when my, I closed my eyes. That was work time. And people think, people think I'm hamming that up, and I'm absolutely not. 
I would open my eyes thinking about the business. I would have breakfast perhaps reading an entrepreneurship book or looking at something relating to the business. I would work all day, maybe kind of take some time off for dinner, but often go and have dinner with someone who potentially could be a great business contact. And there were occasional times where I wasn't doing anything business related, which I got into um, uh, Latin jive dancing for a little bit. And, you know, that was one of the few things that I allowed myself to do that was a complete switch off. But if I was reading, I was reading a business book. If I was watching anything on TV, I would be watching YouTube TED Talks or business related content. Like even my relaxation time, if I was going to go see a movie, I'd see a movie about entrepreneurship, like social network or something like that. And I didn't do weekends, just not interested in weekends. Like I'd just plow through and work through weekends or I'd put, I'd schedule events on weekends and deliver events. So very much happily a performance entrepreneur all in um, doing that. And then what's emerged, because uh, you just can't work that way if you've got three kids under five, what's emerged is what I would say is a team of teams. So Dent now, you know, this morning we had our global leadership call. There was 20 people on it just on the leadership kind of teams, and it's teams of teams. So we have the publishing team, the video production team, the IT services team, the London team, the Melbourne team, the Brisbane team, the Sydney team. So, mm. And we have our team leaders operating. It's almost like lots of lifestyle businesses that are clumped together to make a performance business. Absolutely. It's, yeah. an, it's just an ecosystem of lifestyle businesses. So what we've now done is we've created a business where you can choose, do you want to focus on performance or do you want to focus on lifestyle? And either works with Indent mm. because if you want, you can have a lifestyle business in one of the cities and be a city leader and run a section and be section commander. Or you can jump on the global team and develop assets and develop our, P, uh, our balance sheet. So you can either be focused on a local P&L or a global balance sheet or a little bit of both. So it's actually a kind of cool, flexible company that allows both. I think you've resolved the dichotomy of performance versus leadership business. Yeah, without the extremes. So for example, in a perfect lifestyle business, you wouldn't be on multiple time zones because give you late nights and early morning potential for conference calls. We're on all time zones so therefore, there are some late nights or early mornings. In a pure performance business, you know, I wouldn't be taking time off to go and see, you know, the nursery headmaster about, you know, things relating to trains and, and wheels. It's without the pure edges, but it's certainly got a bl good blend of both. What was the third dichotomy? Famous versus behind the scenes. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so I suppose there's part of me that likes the idea of being known and having a little bit of fame or having even at the extreme having a lot of fame and then there's the part of me that loves the idea of being completely behind the scenes no one knows who runs the business so um, there are certain businesses out there for example rolex incredibly you know originally hans will um, wilsdorf was a very iconic known founder um, who built rolex but today it's almost a secret as to who the hell's involved in the business and what they do and how much they earn. It's a private company owned by a charity and it's very much a secret. So there's that whole a business that hides behind its brand, faceless company. You know, do you want to be Porsche or do you want to be Elon Musk and Tesla? And I can see the benefits and drawbacks of both. So being famous you know, with a single tweet idea, you can you know, sell a million dollars worth of flamethrowers or $20 million worth of flamethrowers, but a poorly thought out tweet and you can get yourself into a major $20 million fine, a billion wiped off the value of PLC, you know, so all of that sort of stuff as well. So I squared that circle with a term called key person of influence and a key person of influence is neither famous nor behind the scenes. They're known within their industry. A key person of influence is someone who's known for being great at what they do and rather than being in the spotlight they become the spotlight so in the spotlight is look at me the spotlight is look at that and i think it's way more exciting way more interesting to become the spotlight rather than to try and be in the spotlight dan i think those are three very well articulated dichotomies that certainly i and i think a lot of our audience could really relate to so thank you to kind of follow a similar thread but uh, maybe shift gears slightly do you feel you spend more time in grind or flow? Um, at the moment, uh, flow mostly. There's not a lot of stuff that I feel like I'm grinding um, to do. Most of the time I'm doing the stuff that I enjoy doing. Has it always been that way? 
No, there's definitely been times. You know, in my books I talk about the desert, crossing the desert. Too big to be small, too small to be big. And in that phase, there's a lot of grind. It's an interesting one. You know you're grinding when the idea of selling the company feels cool. Like, wouldn't it be great to sell the business? And there's this secret desire to get an exit. I would love to exit the business. Wouldn't it be company came along and offered us a lot of money to get out of the business? And you know you've crossed the desert when the idea of selling the business is abhorrent. Like, it's like, there's no way I would sell this business. This Mm. business is awesome. What else would I do? Why would I sell the business? The business provides income and joy and fun and the team is great. And like, it's so cool. So there was certainly about a a year and a half, two years of grind. And I know it must have been grind because I kept being motivated by the idea, wouldn't it be cool to build a business that we could exit, right? I wonder what the valuation of the exit might be. And that was just that secret nagging thought in the back of my head. And I know I've crossed the desert because the idea of selling dent is like no way like mm. no I'll, I'll buy the shares I'll, I'll buy other people's dent shares if they want to sell <laughs> but i'm just i'm wanting to buy the company not wanting to sell it i love it thank you what are you most afraid of for the future of the planet i'm most afraid of the idea that technology is not actually going to help us with joy and that essentially will have created a whole bunch of tech that doesn't actually isn't optimized for what matters most in humanity so look you know there's this future that's unwritten and in one potential future our cleverness and our technology and our intelligence delivers a world that works for everyone and what that means is that everyone has enough food and there's not a lot of suffering in the food chain the planet regenerates and the ecosystem sustainable and and that that works that people do meaningful work people don't feel the need for massive large families they actually have healthy children that they know will grow up and survive so the population doesn't necessarily continue on what could only be described as outbreak and you know we do meaningful work and and all of that is facilitated by technology and then the flip side of that is that we use technology to facilitate outbreak and we take over our ecosystem, we create meaningless work, we remove ourselves from meaningful work and um, you know, we're not a lot better off for it. On the flip side, what are you most excited about for the future of the planet? Well, hopefully steering towards the, you know, the world that works for everyone. Incredibly excited about the United Nations Global Goals. We've actually codified what a world would look like if it worked for everyone really well. We have a structure. It's not a nebulous idea. We have 17 United Nations Global Goals that if we just get behind them and enact the strategy, we will have a world that works for everyone. And all of it's achievable, doable. There's milestones. There's a plan in place. It just really requires more people to be aware of it and take on a little chunk of it. You could get a billion people engaged in the idea. It would probably flow on the flow and effect for the rest of us would be a world that works for everyone. Mm. And I love what you and and we, the collective of Dent, are doing to be able to push that forward. It's really meaningful you know, mission and purpose behind our business. So, Dan, I want to say thank you for hanging out and spending the time to topic that I don't know whether you sit down and talk about these kind of things too, too many times on a podcast, but it's really nice to kind of see the man behind the business, not just the uh, the business guy himself. If I could ask you just a final question, which is, what do you believe the greatest gift that any individual can give to the world? I don't tend to think in terms of those. To me, that doesn't necessarily resonate. I think of humanity as one tapestry, and it appears with any tapestry that there are certain shiny objects on the tapestry. So there might be a certain jewel on the tapestry or a certain feature painted onto the tapestry. And yet if the tapestry were to unravel, if you were to pull on the threads and pull it apart, then it would all fall apart. So the only reason something can stand out is because it sits on top of the tapestry. Um, And I think of humanity as very much just one big tapestry. And there's this desire to leave a legacy. There's a desire to be remembered. And actually, the weird thing is being remembered is the opposite of, of a legacy in the first place. So a legacy is to pass something completely on. So your legacy is what you pass forward and pass on. And if you retain 
significance or acknowledgement for any of that, you actually haven't left a legacy because you didn't pass it on. Mm. You actually retained it. So I like the idea that I like the idea that humanity moves in the right direction and that we all play our part and we move in the you know, together we're moving in the right direction for us all and we're moving that tapestry into a that works for future generations. I don't necessarily personally resonate with the idea of giving a gift or I don't like the idea of significance in those terms. I like the idea that in order to truly leave a legacy, you've completely passed everything on, including significance. Hmm. I love it. Man, it's a joy to be on this tapestry with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cheers. And uh, thanks for jumping on the show. Hey, so thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. As you know, I just love talking life, business, philosophy with like-minded souls who think deeply about the world, their business, and how to live a good life. I'll be releasing episodes on this podcast as regularly as possible, at least twice a week for the foreseeable future. So stay tuned for the next episode. And if you want to join a community of ambitious and driven entrepreneurs, mavericks, change makers, those kind of people, then head to my website, www.mikejamesreed.com. And that's Reed spelled R-E-I-D. You'll find a whole bunch of resources to be able to connect with me and a community of entrepreneurs that are up to something in the world. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Oh, and one final request. If you've enjoyed this show, please give it an honest rating and review on iTunes or any other way that you listen to the podcast. I'd really appreciate it. It just helps the show get found and out to more people's ears who will hopefully love it as much as you do. Thanks so much again and much love from me.